Welcome everybody to one more Talks at Google session today with uh, Joseph Henrik. Uh, the book we're talking about today is The Secret of Our Success, How Culture is Driving Human Evolution, Domesticating Our Species and Making Us Smarter. Joseph Hendricks uh, is Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. He also holds the Canada Research Chair in Culture, Cognition and Coevolution at the University of British Columbia, where he is a professor in the departments of psychology and economics. He is the co-author of Why Humans Cooperate and the co-editor of Experimenting with Social Norms. Please uh, join me in welcoming Joseph Hendricks to Google. Thanks, thanks, Boris. It's good to be with you all today. All right, so I want to begin by introducing you to a puzzle. And the puzzle has to do with how it was that our species became so ecologically successful. So long before uh, the agriculture or the first cities or especially industrial technology, humans expanded out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, parallel the coast here, ended up in Australia by 60, 50,000 years ago, into Europe by 40,000 years ago eventually into the New World, and then down to the tip of uh, Terra del Fuego by about 16,000 years ago. This is all before the origins of agriculture, which begins to emerge around 12,000 years ago. While spreading across the globe, this species of primate entered a vast diversity of habitats. So arid deserts in Australia, the malarial swamps in Melanesia actually got to island Vanuatu by 40,000 years ago. Arctic tundra in Siberia and Canada, and then of course down all the way to Tierra del Fuego. Now, what's interesting about our species compared to other ecologically successful species is that we have few environment-specific genetic adaptations. As a species, we're relatively genetically homogeneous, especially given the number of and diversity of environments we live in. But now if you compare this to other species, so say we took the most successful invertebrate species, that, this would be ants. So ants have covered the earth, they control a massive amount of biomass, but they've done so by speciating into over 14,000 different species. And they have, have agriculture and they have classes, uh, but they've done it in a different way through genetic adaptation. So the question is, how do we do it? Now I take the common sense explanation to be kind of obvious, and this is kind of a dumb question, uh, we're intelligent. So I want to begin by trying to convince you that the secret human, of human success is not our intelligence, that we have a process that makes us smart, that gives rise to our intelligence. So I want to start with dipping into the files that I call the Lost European Explorer files. And uh, these are cases in which explorers got trapped in environments where hunter-gatherers routinely live in, and we get to see if they can survive with their big brains and, and ample hubris. So the, uh, the case I want to I wanna point out is the Burke and Wills case. So if you're from Australia, you've definitely heard of Burke and Wills, the first Europeans to go across the interior of Australia. So they started here in Melbourne, and they go up to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, now, this was a, uh, uh, an expedition launched for both exploration, we want to find out what's in the interior of the continent, but also the possibility of running a telegraph cable from there to there. It was extremely well funded, uh, so they even imported camels from India because they, they thought they would be good in the desert. Now, crucially, a bit of information about Australia. So, Australia, I mentioned it was colonized 60... Yeah. Oh, you're gonna get to was colonized 60,000 uh, years ago, so it was full of hunter-gatherers. So no agriculture had ever emerged in, in there until, until the Europeans arrived. So there's two different expeditions. One group of four men takes off from Cooper's Creek to make the run. Another resupply group is going to meet them in Cooper's Creek. These guys take 12 weeks of food, and they head up there. Now, they don't actually see the Gulf, but they kind of smelled the salt air, found some briny water, and declared victory, because that was eight weeks into the trip. So if you're doing the subtraction, they've only got four weeks of food left. Things start going poorly, and they, start, they run out of food. They have to eat their pack animals. They're having trouble finding food, going very slowly. These guys are waiting for them, and the deadline comes when they have to leave and they're not, they're not supposed to stay any longer. They decide to wait another month, uh, and still these guys don't arrive, so they leave early one morning. Later that same morning, Burke and Wills come in with uh, uh, one other guy. They lost one guy along the way who died, so they have three guys now. They decide they've just missed these guys, and they're not going to be able to catch them. So the leader, Burke, decides their best chance is to head for a police station, or a police station and, and ranch, at a, at a place prophetically called Mount Hopeless. Uh, so these guys start following Cooper's Creek, and that's going pretty well. Uh, oh, so I should mention that they were able to resupply at Cooper's Creek, so they have a little, little resupply. 
they're going along Cooper's Creek and they end up getting trapped because their last camel dies in the mud and there's a stretch of uh, desert that they need to cross in order to get to the ranch and police post. So they can't make the run so they're, they're sort of marooned along Cooper's Creek for, the, for, the, for their lack of ability to find water in the desert. Now they're struggling to catch fish or hunt uh, but they find they're able to possibly survive and things are looking hopeful because they get gifts of fish from, from the local aboriginals, the Yawantru tribe. And when they're in a Yawantru chant, they notice them making nardu cakes. So the nardu cakes are um, this sporocarp. So you gather up these sporocops and the women were grinding them. So Burke and Wills headed out and they managed to find some of these and they ground them and they ate them. So it seemed like they were going to do well because they're getting enough calories and they're getting these gifts of fish. But when they were in the camp, what they didn't notice is that the women actually use a, a sophisticated uh, processing. So they grind them, leach them, heat them, and then only eat them with a mussel shell. You can't let an organic substrate. Yes? What year roughly or decade is this? Oh, 1860. Okay. Should have said that. Um, or they grind them, leach them, and bake them in ash. And uh, because if you don't do that, nardo turns out to be toxic and indigestible. In particular, it has an enzyme called thiamese which depletes the B1 in your system, you eventually get a horrible disease called beriberi. So uh, William Wills, a good Victorian of his time, was actually writing in his journal as he experienced these symptoms. And so you, you can actually read it online. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, so Burke and Wills eventually die. They basically poison themselves and starve to death at the same time. The third member of their group, King, wanders delirious off into the bush, but is rescued by the Iwantru, and eventually gets rescued by a team that came from Melbourne. OK. so. What this and many other tales like it tell us is that despite months actually in the outback with, with supplies in, in order to prepare, these guys couldn't figure out how to survive as hunter-gatherers. They couldn't figure out how to survive in the environments in which we evolved, which, we, which humans have lived in for 60,000 years. So no specialized mental modules fired up, no instincts gave them the ability to figure out what they needed to know, and no general intelligence helped them figure it out and they couldn't find water or identify edible plants. Now you might think, well, that would be pretty hard to do. No animal could do it, except some of their camels escaped. And now the interior of Australia is full of feral camels. Uh, because camels have, they can smell water from a mile away, and they have innate taste and sense cues, which allow them to eat the right plants for them. And so they, even in a completely novel environment, they can find the right plants, but humans can't. If, you know, one important thing that Burke and Wills didn't know about was something that Australians commonly use. This is a plant called spiniflex. And if you break these off and you smash them, you get these little crystals off of it, then you can heat them. And it makes a resin that's as strong as cement once it hardens, but soft and pliable when it's heated. So that, that's really useful for making tools. OK, so they, and they, so they couldn't hunt or uh, uh, hunt effectively, make spears, or make fishing hooks. But this is something any local adolescent could do. So you can ask the question, what was missing? Well, what they were missing is what the adolescent gets, which is this download of a uh, vast body of cumulative cultural information that has built up non-genetically uh, in this whole system of culture and inheritance over generations so that they didn't get that so they can't survive. So this is something that really makes humans different. It's the, going to be the main, the main thing I'm going to be emphasizing as I go along here. But I want to come at this intelligence question from a different angle. Um, so this is a, an experiment done by Esther Herman and Mike Tomasello at the Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. And what these guys did was they uh, put this series of different primate species, so you got your three primate competitors, into a series of 18 cognitive tests to see how they did well they did in the tests. It's actually a picture of my son Josh. Uh, he's a representative two and a half year old. So it's the three primates and the humans are represented only by two and a half year olds. We'll come back to that. Um, so uh, this, if you break the 18 tests down into different categories, there's tests about how you can understand space, how you understand quantities, causality, including tool use here, and your ability to do social learning, to observe someone doing a demonstration and then make, take advantage of, of that demonstration. And you can see how well they did. Um, so the humans here, you know, the humans are doing about as well as the chimpanzees here. Um, no different in quantities. The orangs are doing a little bit worse in each place and causality about the same. And then the big difference is really social learning. And this finding is actually deceptive because uh, they had trouble finding a test where the, the two-year-olds weren't at ceiling and the apes weren't at floor. So they finally found a test where the apes could do it sometimes and the humans did, didn't get 100%. Uh, so this doesn't give you the usual picture of humans being much smarter. So for example, in the tool use test, the chimps actually outcompete the humans. Uh, so the chimps are better at tool use uh, compared to two and a half year olds. Now, like, 
Sorry, what was the age of the uh, primates? The primates actually <coughs> vary in age. Uh, so there were infants, so chimpanzee infants go up to age five, and then juveniles and then adults. So this included infants and uh, adult chimps. Same thing with the orangs. Now what's interesting about that, and, and this is a point I was going to come to in a second, but um, with, hu with humans, this guy is going to get much smarter as he gets older, and, he, and he's going to get much better until by the time he's an adult, he could, beat, he could smash these guys and get 100% on all the tests. These guys don't get better as they get older. In fact, the, the, the five-year-olds and the four-year-olds are just as good as the 25-year-olds. So they don't get better in the cognitive abilities, and that's going to be part of our story. Question? Um, what is the rationale behind studying uh, human kids? Right. So, uh, great question. So, what, why, why not put them up against the adults? And part of the reason is, is Mike Tomasello and his collaborators want to see what it, a less, uh, an uneducated human that has less of the cultural download that he's going to eventually get. So, the idea is to minimize the cultural input. And you'll see why that's, that's important in a second. Because we know the adults could beat the, beat the apes here. So, the question is, how do the kids look like and what's the age trajectory? So, I think I'm going to eventually get to your question uh, more directly. Um, I could sh uh, in the book, you'll see that there's other experiments. So for example, you can take the chimps and compare them to undergraduates, um, and it doesn't matter what country they're from, uh, and compare them on working memory. And the chimps are faster at working memory tasks, so they have faster processing speeds, and at least some of the chimps can tie or even beat the humans in the working memory tasks. And tests of strategic thinking, so uh, there's a game in economics called the matching pennies game. And it requires you to play what's called a mixed strategy. So you, you play a certain strategy some percentage of the time, depending on the payoffs. And chimps are great at that. They zoom right in on what the economists predict as the Nash equilibrium. The humans systematically miss it and can't hit it. They seem to have some strange biases that prevent them from getting there. So at least on these counts, it doesn't look like humans are obviously endowed with some innate brain power that gives them a big advantage on the apes, except in this domain where they really crush the apes. Okay, and this, so this is the point about the, the age effect. Why do humans get smarter? Uh, could you just clarify what you mean by social learning? Sure. Uh, well, so I'll, I'll tell you what the task was. So the task was you had some hard to figure out problem where you had to get a, some food out of a, out of a tube. All these, all these tasks are incentivized by food. All three species like snacks. Um, so uh, you got to see a demonstrator use a tool to push the food out or get the food out in some other way. And then you see if the other, um, the observer will use that technique or is able to get the food out. Okay, so <clears throat> to, head, to head off, you know, because there's kind of an obvious problem here. We know that humans are much smarter, so how do you explain that? So part of the answer for sure is that we culturally inherit pre-built solutions to lots of problems. So it's the software, not the hardware. So just to give you a sense, um, if you grow up in a world with screws, springs, levers, and pulleys, those things are easy to figure out and then reapply if they already exist. But they're actually, each one is hard to invent and, and emerges at different points in human history. Uh, my favorite example is the wheel concept. So if you, if you look at Gary Larson cartoons or something, you, it'll look like cavemen are doing wheels. But the wheel's actually rel invented relatively late in human history, so 6,000 years ago. Um, it's only invented in Eurasia, so it's never invented Australia, the Pacific, uh, or anywhere in the <coughs> New World, except some Mayan toys seem to have wheels, but they didn't put it to use uh, by using, letting their dogs, for example, pull these carts. Uh, el elastically stored energy, so you can make spring traps and bows and arrows by storing energy in, in bendy things and things with elasticity. Uh, that's not invented in the continent of Australia, and neither is compressed air. So, but once you have these things, you can then reapply them in different ways. Let me give you another example. So you all, by, by virtue of learning English, are endowed with uh, an un a system that allows you to count without bounds. So you can differentiate 27 from 28. It's you know, packaged into these nice packets of 10. But lots of societies that anthropologists have studied count one, two, three, many. And then in New Guinea, you can find a whole range of societies. Some count to 27, to 34, to 12, and then they stop. So if you, have, if you have this counting system and you have to distinguish 37 from 38, it, it's hard because you don't have any way to, to mark those, at least linguistically. There are sort of techniques to get around the problem, but they're not nearly as efficient as having a good numbering system, which we know evolved over cultural evolutionary time. And I'll give you one, <coughs> one final example. So English, like lots of modern language, is endowed with three separate spatial coordinate systems for referring to, and it turns out, thinking about space. So one is north, south, east, and west. So that's the absolute coordinate system. And you could say, hey, I'll meet you on the north side of the house. And if we both know the coordinate system, we can both meet on the north side of the house. There's an ego-centered coordinate system with its kind of front-back 
uh, left, right. And you could attach that to a house and say, I'll meet you in front of the house. And, and people have a sense of what the front of the house is. There's also a relative coordinate system. So this is where you could draw yourself a line between myself and the books, and I could say, I'll meet you on the left side of the books. And then we would have a sense of where to go, and that, that comes from this line between the books and I. But lots of languages only have one or two of these. So they don't have right and left or front and back. So they have no ego-centered and no way to say the relative right and left. So if you had to, to set the table, you'd have to say, put the fork at the north end of the table. And then you'd have to have a different rule for every room. Um, so this is a spatial coordinate system which helps us, gives us new tools for thinking and doing things. Like driving on the left would be impossible in populations that only have absolute coordinate systems, north, south, east, and west. All right, so that's just some of the examples that, that we get for free by this cultural inheritance that helps us solve more and more problems. So the key, the secret of our success is not our intelligence, but our cultural abilities. The fact that because we're such powerful social learners, uh, we can accumulate ideas, beliefs, values, heuristics, bodies of know-how, bits of our language. Uh, and these accumulate over time and they form what we call cultural adaptation. So these, I'll give you lots of examples of these, but these are packages of these ideas, beliefs, and values that help people solve different kinds of problems. And it's culturally inherited. The key to these, and so this is a, this is a very mathematical enterprise, so there are lots of models of cultural evolution. You can assume different amounts of fidelity of cultural transmission, and you can assume different amounts of sociality, and you can show that you get different rates of cu uh, cultural accumulation, and you get different equilibria. So the amount of cultural accumulation, how sophisticated your technology gets, actually depends on these two things. Okay, and once you have this, it gives rise to collective brains. So how good a society is at developing new technologies, new ways of solving problems, um, new institutions, how fancy their language is, the number of words in your language, depends on the size of your collected, collective brain. So the interconnectedness between people uh, and the flow of information. All right. Now, the next step is that this is important, but then it turns out to have been important for much of our species' evolution. So this actually drove our genetic evolution. And we have the, in the interaction between two kinds of inheritance system, genetic and cultural inheritance. So one of the problems why I think, well, it's kind of a little bit of sociology, but why this idea has taken a while to take hold um, and influence human evolutionary biology. Yes? On the previous so slide that sociality was, was very important, um, if that's true, then why do we have so many introverts? Like, why didn't we then select for, for more extroverted people that are going to have more social interaction with others? Well, <laughs> compared to lots of species, we're actually quite extroverted and quite willing to engage with people from other groups. So I'll give you an example. When, when two different chimpanzee groups meet, uh, there's go, if, if the two groups are equal size, they're going to start hooting and hollering and gradually back away from each other. If one group is much bigger than another group, they're going to try to kill the other guys. So you have very hostile relations between chimpanzee groups. But humans live in these, at least traditionally, humans live in tribal groups, which have all kinds of relationships between groups. And when you meet someone from another group, um, you you know, you begin to figure out what your connections are, what your social connections are. So, I mean, maybe we're, we're, we're not as outgoing, as friendly as we could be, but we're certainly a long way from other, other primate species. One of, the pro or one, of the, one of the reasons why I think we've had trouble getting this idea, why this idea has, didn't get traction before recently, is because there was this sense in which um, there were cultural explanations for behavior, the kinds that you might get from social psychology, or from anthropology, and then genetic or evolutionary explanations, the kind you might get from biology or sociobiology. But what this approach does is it says, let's take the logic of natural selection that has helped us explain so much of the natural world and apply it to understanding cultural and cultural evolution. So how should natural selection have shaped our minds to make us better learners? And so you think about the capacities for cultural learning. And then these, once you have something that you can make an assumption of, or uh, a, an empirically grounded assumption about psychology can then build models of cultural evolution. So if everybody's using a set of learning strategies, they interact, where does that process go? And then finally, the, the gene culture co-evolutionary point is that this is going to feed back and you, know, you can get this loop here, which I'll, I'll say more about in a minute. Okay, now I want to give you a little bit of a sense of <coughs> how we can use the logic of natural selection to think about learning. And so you can say, how might natural selection have shaped our brains? Uh, and what kinds of content should we look at? So should we be interested in knowledge about plants and animals, about sex, about fire, things like that? Or you can say, who should we pay, pay attention to? We have this whole world full of people we could attend to and learn from. Who is most likely to have information useful to me uh, later in my life or, or now? 
Um, and then finally, how do I integrate that information? So he's doing one thing, she's doing another thing, he's doing a third thing. How can I balance that information? So this is the kind of uh, the approach we take. And these are, these are mathematical models of genes and culture coevolution. So uh, just some sense. So you can say you, there's now quite a bit of evidence that children and adults pay attention to cues of success or skill. So if someone's more successful or better, if someone's better at, at playing golf, if you care about golf, or um, shooting arrows if you're a hunter-gatherer, then you preferentially attend to them and learn from them. Cues of success actually integrate more things. So in hunter-gatherer groups, you can look at the guy who brings back the most big prey. Doesn't say exactly how it did it, but you know he's doing something right if he's able to consistently bring back the, the most big prey. Cues of prestige are kind of a second order effect. So if everybody is doing this and they're trying to figure out who should I pay attention to in my social group, then you can look, step back and look at who others are paying attention to. So who's being deferred to in conversation? Who are people tending to watch? Who do people say nice things about? And those are cues of prestige or deference. And that helps a learner, in, in combination with these other cues, zoom in on people most likely to have good information for them. Age seems to be an important cue. So for young children, this can be valuable because a young child has to scaffold up their skills. So they might, if you're a five-year-old and you're in a hunter-gatherer community, you might know who the best hunter is. He's probably about 38 or 40. Um, but his skills are way too advanced for you as a five-year-old to get to. So you can look at the best seven-year-old. And then when you're seven, you can look at the best nine-year-old. So you can self-scaffold your skills up that way. Another interesting way in which you can pry information out of this system is to look at older people. So in, in lots of societies, not everybody gets to be old. So by the time you have people who are 60, 70 years old in a, in a small scale society, natural selection has taken out a bunch of other people. So if you get to be 60 or 70, you've already, um, there's already been, there's informational content in the fact that you've gotten to be that old. And then finally, self-similarity cues. So if the sexual division of labor is at, all, is at all old, and lots of paleoanthropologists think it is, then males should tend to focus in and, and learn from males, and females should tend to focus in and learn, and learn from other females. Same thing with uh, dialect and ethnicity. So in order to get the right norms for the people you're most likely to interact with later in life, it seems our psychology at a young age causes us to key in on those who speak a language like our own, and preferentially both interact with them and, and imitate them. So these cues, there's now ample evidence that this is relevant for lots of different domains. There's differing degrees of evidence for all these domains, but really basic things like food preferences. So if you want to get your child to like a certain food that he or she doesn't like, you should put them at a table with same-sex kids who are slightly older. And they also have to like the food that they, you're trying to get the kid to like. Uh, and so there's good experimental work on that showing that they'll, they'll shift their preferences. Uh, what people like in mates can be affected by these things, economic strategies. Suicide actually spreads through these things. So when a celebrity commits suicide, people will copy method and you can predict that it's going to be people who match them on sex and ethnicity, statistically speaking. Um, and motivations for fairness and punishment also can be transmitted this way. Okay, now what this says, you can't see it, it's blocked here, but these things, these appear to be adaptations. So they reliably develop. We see them in children as young as one. Uh, they operate automatically. People don't know they're doing it. And they can often remain unconscious. So they're adaptations, mental adaptations for cultural learning. Now once you have those, in individuals interact. So say generation after generation, you're copying those who are most successful and healthy and, and have all those cues. You're going to eventually be able to produce cultural adaptations without anybody knowing about it. Let me give you an example. So, uh, uh, two biologists studied the patterns of spicing across uh, around the earth, and other animals don't use spices. So this is kind of a funny thing. There's, you don't get any nutrition from spices, and there's no um, caloric content to spices, nothing significant. But, um, and the other thing is when you begin to look at the active ingredients in spices, they've often evolved to keep mammals away. So natural selection has favored uh, capsicum in spices. Uh, in chili peppers in order to prevent mammals from eating them because they want to be eaten by birds because birds do better dispersal. So the, the chemicals in this actually taps right into our, our, some of our pain systems and causes us to feel pain. The thing with humans is we can see someone experience pain uh, and I mean see someone eat a chili pepper and they're going to experience what would be pain for most animals but if they seem to like it, we can learn to like it. Uh, so we seem to be able to overcome our innate aversion. So chimps won't eat chili peppers, and babies don't like chili peppers. This is why they recommend to nursing mothers not to eat too many chili peppers, because it gets into the milk, and the baby might not like the milk. So, um, but these spices seem to be, uh, they are used in the hottest climates, and they seem to be chemically active against pathogens. So if you use the spices typically found in traditional recipes, 
on, you know, it's, they're typically meat recipes, they actually reduce the, um, the load of pathogens in the meat. They're effective against pathogens. So they're, a, they're kind of a pathogen reduction system, and you, correlations across the globe, you don't find people in Norway using many spices. Uh, the Inuit don't use many spices, but when you go into the tropics, there's lots and lots of spices, and they tend to be the spices most effective at suppressing pathogens traditionally. Another one is, uh, is corn. So when the Europeans arrived in the Americas, there were a number of popula many populations dependent on corn, maize. And the, the thing about maize is if you become dependent on it, it actually has, uh, it's, you, you can't get enough niacin from maize unless you do something very non-intuitive to it, which is to mixing an alkali. So uh, you can put burnt seashells into it, you can shovel ash out of your fire into the corn mix, and then what that does is it chemically breaks open the niacin, and then you can get to it and you don't get a uh, terrible disease called pellagra. Now, <clears throat> we have a natural experiment that shows us that this is hard to figure out. So all these different Native American groups had figured out various versions of this trick. Uh, but when the Europeans took it, it comes over to Europe, and it becomes a staple food in many poor populations. And there were epidemics of pellagra that went on for centuries until actually the, the guy who, f who figured it out was Joseph Goldwater, an American. But it took him years to convince the medical establishment who they all thought it was a pathogen. And then finally, I've done this work in Fiji, uh, and there are these food taboos against particular marine species when women are pregnant or nursing. And when you begin to look at the species, you find that they're all ones high in singuatera toxin. So if you've spent any time in the tropics living off reef fish, this is something you've got to watch out. Don't eat the moray eel. Uh, and there's a number of other species, barracuda, who are potentially high in singuatera toxin. So this is a case where there's a bunch of taboos, which people don't know why they have, and they just know, you know, pregnant, breastfeeding, don't eat these fish. The taboos kick in. And um, the taboos seem to be effective. Women during those periods don't have any kind of fish poisoning. So it's a, it's, these are adaptations that evolve unconsciously over generations that people didn't figure out or have any causal model for. And the book is, bo book is full of lots of these. Okay, now once you begin to, when, you, you know, you, once you accept that and you begin to study it, you find, you come to the collective brain idea, which is that larger, more in, in, interconnected populations will generate more rapid cultural evolution and their equilibrium of how fancy their tools, technologies, and practices can get uh, is higher. It also means that if suddenly a population is cut off, they will begin to lose know-how. So it, you've got to maintain that size in order to keep your adaptive complexity. So let me show you a little bit of evidence. So this is uh, research done by Michelle Klein and, and Rob Boyd. And it's hard to study continental populations because technologies and ideas can move fluidly and it's not clear what a population is. How do you, how do you kind of isolate that? But in the Pacific, it's easier because you have islands. Now, of course, these islands aren't all disconnected. There was movement between them and people moving between them. But it at least gives you a way to encapsulate a population. Then you can measure the amount of interconnectedness. So they measured how fancy the tools were in these different islands in the Pacific. And they went back to the, uh, you know, this is the ethnography from the first arrivals, from the, the missionaries and the anthropologists and the early explorers on how fancy the fish getting or the, the marine foraging technology was. And they use a simple method. Uh, nobody's ever really completely satisfied with this method, but you take each tool and you break it down into a bunch of component parts. So each tool gets a measure called techno units. It's the number of parts in the tool. Okay, so uh, these are population sizes of the different islands, and these are the islands are represented there, and that's the number of tools. So you can see the larger the population, the more tools they have, and the larger the population, the higher uh, the, the higher the number of average techno units per. So that there's more tools and more complicated tools. Now, the high and low contact is whether the islands were sort of isolated for long periods of time or whether they had routine trade contact with other islands. And contact has an independent effect popu of population. So you can look at this graph and you can see that the um, high contact islands tend to be above the regression line I'm showing here and the low contact tend to be below. It's 10 data points, so it's not that not that big a sample, but all right. Okay, so that is consistent, although there's lots of things that could be affecting those, those technologies. These guys did a whole bunch of regressions. They include all kinds of ecological variables. In general, it seems to hold up, but of course you only have 10 data points, so you have to put the other variables in one at a time. But uh, my grad student, Michael Muthu Krishna and I, we wanted to see if we could replicate this idea in the laboratory. So um, this is with uh, 100 undergraduates at the University of British Columbia. 
and students come into the lab and what they have to do is they're given a complex image editing program and they're told they have to replicate this image. And the closer they get to this image, the more money we will pay them, so they're paid in cash. They have a time limit. And um, for everybody but the first, so there's going to be a bunch of generations. So there's going to be a bunch of guys that come in, they do this once, and then another group comes in and they get information from the previous generation. And then they get to do it and they can pass information down to the next generation. We do this for 10 generations. And either you can only access one other person. One person came before you and you learn from them, pass to that guy, that guy. Or you can look at all five. So you're this guy, but you can check out what these, all these guys did and then 10 generations. So that's the one or five models. So for, for after you do it, then you can write up information and pass it down to, to your students. So you get two pages of things to pass down. So your student gets your product, so whatever image you made. They also get this, so they get to know what you're trying to get to. Um, and they get your write-up. So then we can take each image, and we've done this a number of different ways, but you can get a uh, measure of similarity between whatever the person made and this target image. So you get a score. So uh, 10 generations. Um, you can see in the one model treatment, that's the blue, those guys never really go anywhere. They just kind of bounce around. They had a really good first round, actually, but then things bounce around. Uh, and these guys start off slow there, but then they just take off, right? And so they end up with much higher, much more, they're producing images much closer to the target image over 10 generations. You know, people are randomly assigned a treatment group, so we know there's no intelligence difference, but something about the informational dynamics let these guys do a lot better. Um, it's also clear from other analyses that uh, each learner is recombining ideas from the other learners. So this allows people to come up with innovations without invention. So because they're recombining ideas from, from other learners. This is kind of a fun thing to look at because it gets, you get to see a big chunk of the data here. So this is the one model treatment and the five model treatment. This is each generation. So you can see the one, this first generation of the one models did pretty well. Those things look moderately like that. These guys did terrible. I don't know. Some people didn't even turn in answers. Uh, and so, but then things go awry here on the next generation, and these guys aren't really going anywhere here at all. But then things click in. You get this guy, and then you get these guys, and then things are rolling, and these guys are chugging along. By the time you get to the end here, the worst one in t round 10 is better than the best guy here. Uh, and, and that's yeah, just all informational dynamics. Okay. Let me give you the, the case of the polar Inuit. So I mentioned earlier, one of the things about the collective brain is the possibility that you could lose information. Um, so we have kind of a natural experiment. So these are the, the northernmost group of hunter-gatherers in the world, the polar Inuit. And uh, two explorers, Elisha Kane uh, and Isaac Hayes, winners with them in the, uh, in the, 19, in the 1850s and uh, 1863. And they lacked many of the technologies, the fancy tools that Inuit typically have that have been recorded by so many other explorers and anthropologists. So uh, Inuit houses typically have a long entrance. It's a heat system. You, you keep the heat outside by, by trapping it. Uh, to the snow houses, they didn't have that. They lacked the bow and arrow, which is necessary for hunting caribou. Inuit typically have complex compound bows. Um, and, the, and the fishing luster, which is these three-pronged fishing fears. That, so when you spear a fish, you, you need the, the prongs, otherwise the fish will just slide right off. So they lacked all three of those things. And crucially, they lacked kayaks. So they lost the ability to make kayaks. Things were going wrong, so they were limited on what they could hunt and fish, and their, their populations were declining. Um, now, crucially, uh, John Ross, another explorer, had been there in the 1820s. And he records them as having all these things. So sometime between 1820 and 1850, 1860, they, they lost all of these uh, technologies. Now later, uh, a Norwegian named Newt Radmussen figured out the puzzle here. It turned out that after Ross had been there, there had been some whalers visiting. And this initiated a plague, uh, which took out the most senior members of the community. So with, with them died their, their knowledge. Uh, so this, this means the information in the community took a quick hit from the plague, but then it was never able to be rege regenerated uh, by, the, by the people in the community. Uh, he, 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 he meets this guy, uh, Rasmussen meets this guy, and he tells him the story about how th they came to have the technology again. Because by the time Newt's there in, in 1900, they have all the technology back. So after the plague, they, they weren't able to regenerate. And then this guy is traveling north. He's a, he's a Baffin Island Inuit. And they encounter them. And he and his group teach them 
all the stuff they'd lost. So they're able to get it back. Because in some sense, you can think of them as being reconnected to the collective brain. And they, they had lost, in part because they lost kayaks. So they couldn't you know, go to other groups and get it. They sort of became marooned in that part of Greenland. And um, there's good kind of circumstantial evidence to, to believe this account is true. So um, they were hunting again with their bows and arrows. Uh, and they were using kayaks. For the seals, the population decline had reversed and it was increasing. And their kayaks that they used were resembled the Baffin, Al Baffin Island type and not the one typical of Western Greenland. So you can see that it was actually him that taught it because he came from Baffin Island. Uh, they now eventually, in the next 50 years, their kayaks revert back to Western Greenland, but that's because they've been reconnected. So now they're more connected to the rest of the Greenlanders. The next thing, the next point I want to make is so there's all this important on these cultural adaptations and on this accumulation of know-how, but this has actually affected our genetic evolution. So in the book, I spend time trying to figure out when the process of cumulative cultural evolution got started. And I think there's good reason to believe it started over a million years ago. So the way to think about this is once our genetic evolution gives us enough cultural capacities to get cumulative cultural evolution, you create an autocatalytic process. So the cultural evolution produces a few tools that are better than individuals could make on their own. You get fire and cooking and some tracking information and food. And then you're a learner. And you can either try to figure this stuff out for yourself, or if you're a good enough learner, you can learn it from the other members of your community. And so that's going to favor brains that are better at doing cultural learning, at acquiring and organizing all of this information. Uh, then once you have bigger brains, you're going to increase the size of this pool. So you get this interactive effect where n no matter how big your brain gets, you're going to have more valuable cultural information that if you can't learn it and acquire it, you're going you're to lose. Now this process, of course, eventually hits the stops. Because of the, the primate body plan, the, uh, the canal where the baby has to come through can only get so big. And so natural selection has shaped us so that our, our uh, babies are born premature. Their heads kind of squish up when they come through the canal. Other primates don't have this problem. Uh, and in fact, our babies are born about a trimester too early because the woman's body has to get the baby out before its head gets too big. So this has kind of hit the stops. But of course, this problem continues to spiral. And we, soon we have a division of labor between males and females, and then other kinds of division of labor, external storage systems, et cetera, as that information continues to expand. OK. Now, at the same time, it's creating a general pressure for brains that are capable of organizing and storing this information. It's also creating specific genetic adaptations. So these are, these are genetic adaptations that we have that are driven by cultural evolution. So let me give you, uh, start off with some physiological and anatomical examples. Uh, fire and cooking. So um, my colleague Richard Rangham at Harvard has analyzed our kind of digestive tract. So our teeth are small. We have stomachs that are too small for a primate of our size. Our colons are too short for a primate of our size. We don't seem like uh, we have these anomalies relative to other primates, but they all make sense if you think of us as an obligate cooking species. So we're required to pre-digest our food in some sense by cooking it or processing it in other ways, making it easy to chew so we don't need small teeth, uh, breaks it down. Now, the interesting thing about cooking is fire, as, as my book shows in lots of lost European explorers, we're terrible at making fire when we need to make fire. We, and though unless we have technology to make fire, we, we're not good at just figuring out how to do it. So we need this cultural know-how to figure out how to make fire and to cook, but then that shaped our biology. The same is true of, let me go to uh, running. So Dan Lieberman has argued that our bodies are uh, adapted for long distance running. So we have this amazing sweating system that other species don't have that dumps sweat onto us that can only cool us if you're actually running. We have springy arches in our feet, with, which other primates don't have. And we have a nuchal ligament in the back of our head here, which allows our head and, and shoulders to turn independent of each other, whereas chimps are kind of like this, right? They can't, they can't do that. And other animals that have that are things like horses and other running species. Um, so those are two physiological examples. And oh, I'm sorry, in this case, the reason why you need the culture stuff is um, the sweating system. Ha and there's a, there's a reason tracking, but I'll just tell you the sweating one. Um, if you look at, so it looks like an amazing system of adaptations for long distance running. We can outrun all kinds of animals. We can outrun dogs. You know, these other animals can't do marathons or even come close. But, and our, we have this great sweating system, but there's no water tank. So you start running, you would immediately run out of stuff to put in the tank. You wouldn't sweat, and, and the whole thing collapses. And the way hunter-gatherers do this, when you study hunter-gatherers who are chasing down antelopes, is they have knowledge about where to find water. And they have cultural technologies for carrying water, like ostrich eggs. 
And it, you know, so you need that cultural know-how in order to, to make the system work. So it's a, it's a package of genetic and cultural adaptations. Uh, now, developmental psychologists have noticed that young children seem to have a specialized system for acquiring information about plants and animals. So a simple example is category-based induction, which is never learned. We do it automatically. So if you learn that Felix, the cat, likes milk, you don't just assume, well, that's Felix. Felix has a particular taste for milk. You generalize that to all cats, and you assume it's a feature of cats. And then if I say, well, what about a tiger? Would a tiger like milk? You can say, well, probably, because you know, they're kind of related, and I think they're close. So if I had to bet, tigers would like milk. So you can, we have this system that, that we don't learn that we seem to get automatically. Same thing about artifacts. Kids readily distinguish between different kinds of artifacts. And when they know something's a tool, then they begin to say, what is it for? When it's not in the tool category, they're less concerned about function, so they apply a functional stance to tools. Humans seem to have uh, two kinds of status. One kind of status we inherited from our, our non-human primate ancestors, chimpanzees. So chimps have dominant status. Dominant individuals can control, control costs and benefits. They do it by force and force threat. But humans have another kind of status that's due to this fact that when you have a social group, they're going to vary in their knowledge and skill and abilities. And if someone has a lot of knowledge, skill, and abilities, and you're a social learner, you're, you can learn from other people, then you can tap that. And now you want to pay them deference in order to get access to their information. And here the ethology is totally different. So in dominance, you stay away from the dominant. You don't look at him, keep your head down. But if you've got to learn from him, you've got to watch him and get close to him so you can learn from him. So you lead to two different kinds of status. And there's a lot of research on psychology about how human status partitions into these two kinds. Cultural evolution also um, produces social norms. So we acquire rules about how to behave, and we acquire rules for judging others. And once you have that, then you can have these mutually reinforcing stable equilibria, where uh, economists call these Nash equilibria. Right? Once everyone's there, we have a rule. Everyone has to wear clothes. And if anybody deviates, it's not wearing clothes. Um, and so, and, but then different groups can get very different norms, and this can get sorted out through groups competing with each other. But we seem to have a norm psychology, so we're prepared from a young age to say, I don't know what the rules are in this world, but I, I, I know there's rules, and I've got to start trying to figure out how to learn from them. We have lots of inferential machinery to help us with that. And then finally, we, we seem to have an ethnic psychology. So cultural evolution goes first here, and it produces a world in which different groups have different norms, and they're marked by different markers like dialect or dress or whatnot. And then young learners readily key in on that. And I mentioned before how young kids preferentially learn from those who share their dialect. That's because they need to get the underlying information, because they're going to be interacting most likely with members, at least in traditional societies, of those who, who uh, share their dialect are also going to share their norms. That's who they're going to have to interact with. I'm happy to say more about any of those if you're interested. Do you have a question about the last one? Then? Yeah. Um, so my understanding is that that at least is something that you see in other animals, especially in other mammals, right? That they, you'll have, you know, some area in Africa with a bunch of different animals, but the, the animals of a particular species will congregate together rather than with other animals that are kind of related but not the same species. So it's a different maybe level of categorization, but it's still kind of a selecting um, other people that are other you know, animals to stay with that are very like you. Yeah, so the, the big difference is whether it's your local group of familiars that you grow up with or whether this can be applied to some, someone you've never met. Um, and so that's, again, this idea that humans live in tribes, so they're strangers. But if you share these cultural markers, then you're preferentially interacting, preferentially learn. Animals don't do the social learning either. Yes? I'm so old. Culture sounds great. So why don't all animals do this? Why are we so different? Yeah, so that's a great question, and that is like, let's see, chapter 17, no, 16. Um, so there's a startup problem. And the problem is, is when culture's rare, it's not, you know, natural selection doesn't want to make the investment in making you a good cultural learner, because if there's nothing out there to learn, then uh, it's, a, it's a wasted investment. So in that case, you should invest in individual learning and make you better at figuring out things on your own. So the only way to jumpstart the whole system is to somehow get a lot of cultural information out there in the minds of others. Then selection can favor a brain that can take advantage of that information. So it's kind of like a fitness valley if you, if, when you do the math. Um, so in the book, I lay out a case uh, for how we could have crossed that fitness valley. And I don't, <coughs> I don't posit any magical genes that suddenly appear. I posit an ecological circumstance. So in the, in the Pleistocene, humans faced intense uh, predator, uh, pressure from predators. And what animals do when they face uh, predator from pressures is they live in bigger groups. 
And I talked earlier, if you have a larger group, you're more likely to begin to get this process going because there's more people to learn from, more individuals to have individual ideas. Uh, and was probably a savanna dweller because they would have been most susceptible to, to predation. Um, there's a number of other factors. The, the climate was starting to oscillate in a way that would have also put a pressure on, on social learning. So in the book, I kind of put together a series. And then once, and that's the idea, is that those ecological factors push you across this thing. You begin to turn the wheels on cumulative cultural evolution. And then you can do the selection pressure, and it'll pay off. So are there other animals who are maybe good at social learning who could have done this, and maybe not so good on the other? Uh, measures of intelligence? Yeah, well, so uh, throughout the book, I use, I use chimpanzees a lot because chimps do have some cultural traditions. Um, and this is relevant to this point. So chimps live in these fission fusion groups, and they do transmit things like techniques for nut cracking, techniques for getting at ants, a um, few, uh, few other things. And the problem is, is that most of the time, a young chimp is only with mom. So you can only have, ever have vertical transmission. But if you had a group that was pushed into large groups by predation, then the young chimp could, could look at all these different potential models and learn not just from mom, but from ants and, and all these other, other possibilities. So uh, chimps are, are a cultural species. Another interesting species that's relevant are elephants um, and dolphins. Um, elephants have some cultural learning. And, and actually, one of the things I talk about in the book is the evolution of menopause uh, and elephants and at least some species of toothed whales, of, of cetaceans, have menopause too. And I think a similar cultural story is, helps explain that. Basically, if you have some cultural abilities, when you get old, there's an, there's an opportunity for you to shut down your reproductive system so you can continue disseminating your cultural knowledge uh, to the younger generation. I always find sports teams really interesting. Um, you know, when they're young, they're just focusing on the sport. But how do they become a coach? And um, For example, Jacques Demer, he said he couldn't read. Please won a Stanley Cup, and you see, you know, what's, I don't know if you've studied those, and what's the factors that are playing in, because those people, they're not going to MBA programs, they're not in business, but how do they go from a player to running an organization that's quite uh, complex? So, uh, how do, so how, um, how do people end up running sports teams? Yes, when they started off as a player. Okay. Because it's a completely different yeah. skill. Is yeah. it the institutional knowledge? Sure. Are they? Yeah, well, so I, I haven't studied that, but my, my intuitions would be that they're heavily influenced by the coaches and the managers and all the people that they were exposed to over the course of their time. So they're kind of the old fashioned style, apprentice, apprentice style learning. All right. Um, so this is just a quick uh, review of the stuff I've talked about. So we can approach our learning, uh, uh, our learning abilities as adaptations for extracting information from the social world and also from the environment. So one of the things we focus on is when should you use social learning? When is that optimal? And when is it optimal to switch over and, and rely on your own experience? This creates a second system of inheritance, which leads to culture-driven genetic evolution. So I briefly pointed to some examples that I discuss in the book of, of how culture has driven our genetic evolution. One of the things I didn't get much chance to talk about was the process of self-domestication. So I mentioned how cultural evolution gives rise to social norms and institutions. So this means that if you deviate from what the group does, you're going to get punished or a bad reputation. People will gossip about you, be mad at you. But that's eventually going to get people to be more compliant, to fall into line and to do what the group wants them to do, to be more conformist, uh, more docile. So you get this process of self-domestication. It's part of the process that makes us more cooperative. So one of the things I discuss a lot in the book is the evolution of cooperation. Didn't, didn't fit into today's talk. Um, now, if we can expand our cultural brains, we can generate faster cumulative cultural evolution, more innovation. Um, and then a final point that I'll leave you with, there's a whole chapter on this, which is that culture is part of our biology in two separate ways. One, that our genetics have been shaped by cultural evolution. But the second is, and people often separate you know, culture from biology, but when you learn to read, for example, so that's a cultural practice, you've got to learn to read, it actually changes your brain. You have a thicker corpus callosum. That's the information highway that connects your two brains after you've learned to read, if you compare literate and non-literate populations. You have a larger verbal memory. You actually have specialized circuitry that's specifically for recognizing letters in your left hemisphere. Um, so culture shapes our biology uh, in non-genetic ways as well. And that's, that's the end. Everything you said makes a lot of sense to me, but there, there's one aspect of evolution that um, I'm wondering whether or not we have any or you have any better understanding of, because it, it seems to me that there's like a 
there's a necessary requirement for either kind of evolution that requires a certain amount of variance in the population. Um, and it, the, if, if that's the case from a cultural standpoint, that there would be a risk or that you wouldn't want the population to be too good at learning, otherwise they could latch on the wrong thing and then everybody's dead. Like, is there any sort of understanding or any evidence or, or, or model to understand like how that works or where the right balance is? Yeah, I mean, that's the right intuition. So that's certainly what we get from the models is, you know, variance is the engine of, of all these evolutionary processes. The thing about culture, one reason to worry about that less is actually it's more of a worry with genetic evolution because genetic replication is so much more exact than, than cultural transmission. Even when people are good copies, there's still lots of noise. And the other thing that culture has is multiple models. So, well, genetic evolution, you either have one parent or two parents, usually, uh, some exceptions to that. But um, in cultural evolution, you could have 50 parents, and you're actually recombining ideas. So your actual repertoire doesn't look like any of your 50 parents, because it's a, it's a recombination of all those. So it's, it can definitely happen, it could, and I could, you know, there's probably specific cases of maladaptation where everybody was forced to do exactly the same thing. But in general, I think it's less of a problem for cultural evolution. So just a quick question on the feedback loop between genetic and cultural revolution. Seems like the genetic part might not be very relevant today. There's not a lot of lion and bear running outside, right? So how does the cultural evolution work today? Like what's your thought on that like for the next hundred years? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I guess I don't think uh, there's been, there's, if anything, there's been an acceleration of gene culture co-evolution in the last 10,000 years. So I'll, I'll give you, so one of the things I do in, in chapter six is I discuss recent evidence uh, from the human gene on, on gene culture co-evolution. And so one, one good well, well studied example is lactose. So um, some populations uh, domesticated cows and then didn't develop cheese or yogurt technology. So this, put a, this created a selection pressure for people to be able to, uh, no normally in humans, in, like in other mammals, uh, babies can drink milk and then the whole system shuts down for adults. So adults can't process uh, milk and get the sugar and the nutritional benefits. But in some populations that had this particular cultural situation, selection favored keeping that system on. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a change on chromosome two and it just wipes out the regulatory gene that normally prevents the lactose gene from, from uh, from operating. So you get adults who can drink milk into adulthood. And this is spread faster than any other known, known gene, essentially. Um, there's also genes for alcohol dehydrogenase that seem to be associated with uh, the emergence of agriculture. So I think there's good reason to think that culture is actually more of a pressure on uh, human genetic evolution now. How do you think this would affect like family size? Do you think somebody could use this as an argument against having an only child? reasoning that they have fewer, say, older siblings they can look up to as kind of cultural parents? Or do you think that's not as relevant because we normally raise our kids in large group settings? Yeah, so I think that probably isn't um, relevant because so in all our studies of young kids, they seem to be very willing to look widely and learn from all kinds of other individuals besides their siblings. Um, so I've worked in three small scale societies in the Pacific and Peru and in rural Chile. And there the kids live in a big group basically in the middle of the village or in the beach in the village. And uh, I mean, of course, older siblings have some influence, but they seem just as happy with the neighbor's older sibling. Or so in this slide, I see uh, a kind of a positive feedback loop that keeps our brains getting larger, keeps our uh, culture getting more complex and advanced until we reach that limit where with uh, brain size. Uh, at the same time, my understanding is Humans used basically stone tools for the better part of 100,000 years without a lot of advancement, which doesn't seem to jive with this. Yet, somehow in the last few millennia, technology got a whole lot more advanced. How, does, how do all these things square up? Um, OK, so, two, so I mean, let's see. This is chapter 15. Um, I go through the stone tools, and I don't think there's any evidence of stasis in, in the anthropological record. So tools get better. Adhesives get added, projectile weapons are in, got spears, wooden spears at 400,000. But this is on the scale of millennia. I mean, yeah, think so what things, we've done things are going in the last slower. two millennia. So, yep. Yeah. So um, d definitely there's been an exponential explosion, but that's actually what you get out of the models when you begin to consider the, uh, the size of populations, the emergence of communication technology where you have more and more minds interacting, and you have trade routes that's running information across different, and then you have recombination of different ideas. Uh, I, right, r r writing, all, yeah, all kinds of c communication, yep. Um, so that's, that's what I think happened. Chapter 15. Speaking about the d domestication of the human species, 
how would you, you know, like connect that with the, let's say, contemporary politics of Democrats and Republicans, ah. you know, like big government, small government? Is, is there anything going on there that, that is, uh, or well, is this just, you know, like, is it a completely disconnected effect? And the other, uh, in, at the same venue is, you know, like, I mean, there's, you know, like, obviously, Uh, group learning that advances society and advances our culture, but there's also been, you know, like groups of people that did, uh, you know, like less palatable things. Is there any comments, you know, like from your angle sure, sure. about those? Um, so uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is is using the same kind of approach. You can think about the emergence of maladaptation. So the the stuff I talked about often gives rise to culture, to adaptations, but there are interesting models in which, and then I think actual empirical cases, where the whole thing goes completely awry. And the easiest one to understand are, is the prestige situation. So if you have something where uh, there's a certain cue, like in, so I'll give you the, the Melanesian example. So it, uh, in Melanesia, men got prestige for growing yams. And so people copied the bigger yam growers. But then it was, then they began to have competitions to see who could grow the biggest yam. And then they would grow bigger and bigger yams and they'd have competition. But it turns out when yams get a certain size, they're not edible anymore. So there's all these guys pouring all these resources into making these giant yams, which are largely unedible. So that's kind of where you know, things begin to get maladaptive from, from the genetic evolutionary point of view. But the guys are, you know, they're into it. In fact, the Fijians have yam competitions, the group I worked with. Um, the contemporary politics question, uh, it seems to me, what, so one of the things that this kind of suggested that we have a tribal psychology, that we're looking for people to build relationships with that share our, our cultural beliefs, speak our language in the same dialect, share our same cultural cues. And so I feel like that has relevance for understanding some political division. Uh, yeah, I was wondering also, I mean, a lot, of the, um, a lot of the culture that we have is, so if you look at, say, the culture that chimpanzees have, it's sort of tool use that is consistent with their biology. But a lot of, I mean, especially when we get to more complicated uh, human tools, they sort of crucially rely on things like opposable thumbs and separately movable digits that other primates don't have. So do you feel like, is, again, there's some sort of feedback between the evolution of culture and the yeah. development of these things? So uh, I didn't talk about it in this case, but there's a bunch of changes with our nerves. So we, you know, our ability to sort of directly move each, our fingers and whatnot, is probably a co-evolutionary effect of, of co-evolving with tools. So tools are evolving culturally to fit our hands, but our hands are also adapting to be, to be better at using tools. This is very clear in our tongue. So we've clearly had evolution to make us better language users. So uh, you talked about uh, the benefits of learning from a large number of different people, uh, different adults. But these days, one of the things that we've heard about a lot is that the internet is becoming an echo chamber. So you tend to learn only from people that are very, very similar to you and you're able to effectively filter out other opinions and views. Uh, does that bode bad f uh, badly for our future? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> uh, well, so this fits into the interconnectedness problem, right? So if the internet is, so right, the great promise of the internet is it fully interconnects us and we can learn all this stuff. But if we're only connecting to people we like uh, or are very similar to us, then you, you, you lose that flow of ideas and the diversity, the power that comes from the variation in, in, in selection systems. I loved your presentation. And <clears throat> sorry if this seems a little uh, insulting, but how much of this is new ideas? And I ask because a lot of what you said reminded me strongly of some kind of old science fiction like Larry Niven's Ringworld, where okay. society degrades due to disconnection. Okay. Um, I don't know Ringworld. Um, but this, so this is stuff that draws together things I've been working on since the mid-90s. Um, so yeah, it's 20 some years of, of stuff. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it varies in how new it is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, in some sense, it's, um, it's sort of my, my career up to this point kind of summarized. What other questions about evolutionary biology are scientists still trying to look at and answer right now that maybe we sort of have some vague theories about, but maybe are like bigger questions that people are still trying to solve right now? Well, um, I think the big, I mean, center of a lot of debate is the, uh, the origins of human cooperation. And that's one of the real kind of flashpoints. So the position I defend in the book is that uh, it's been a culture gene interaction and that intergroup competition is really important. But a lot, uh, there's another group of scholars, for example, that, that really reject the idea that intergroup competition was important, that groups were kind of fighting with each other and those who had the best ways of organizing won, and then that led to a gene culture co-evolutionary process. So cooperation is certainly one. 
I mean, with the, with the human genome, we're really just, it's kind of a, a Wild West, New Frontier time, because there's so much interesting genetic variation that we're finding, and just going through and looking at what caused that variation. A, a lot of it's turning out to be cultural differences among populations that then lead to genetic differences. And with that, let's please thank our guest today.